Okay, let me offer this toast to you, to your dedication to preserving Idaho and keeping it the way it is for future generations, for your perseverance and your patience and sticking with us in making sure that this happened, to Rick for all his work, to Lindsay for all his work, but most of all, to God's work, the Boulder White Clouds Jerry Peak Wilderness Area. Thank you all. The exhilaration at Redfish Lake Lodge in the spring of 2016 was palpable. Something that seemed virtually unattainable even a year earlier had finally been achieved, and people were celebrating. It's nice to have it done. You know, if anybody would have told me when we started that it was going to take 15 years, I would have thought, now you're crazy. Because to me, when I started, it was a challenge, and then it became a passion, and it seemed so obvious of something that needed to get done. And I will tell you, even if had we never completed this, had this bill not been signed into law, this effort would have been successful because we have people talking with each other that would have never talked before, would never sit down at the same table. Now they actually talk to each other. That doesn't mean they always agree, but 90% of it is talking, and that's what people are starting to do. We all love this land and want to enjoy it, and we want our future generations to enjoy it. The Boulder White Clouds are iconic. They needed to be preserved, not for us. They're not gonna be destroyed by what we do today and tomorrow. That happens over time. We need to protect them for future generations that will be able to enjoy these as we are today. The slow, convoluted history of the Boulder White Cloud Saga is, in many respects, a microcosm of the nation's environmental battles. And when viewed with the long lens of history, it becomes even more instructive. This vision of Castle Peak and the White Clouds could today look something like this. In fact, the smart money was on an open pit molybdenum mine at the base of Castle Peak. One of those who remembers the early mining activity in the White Clouds is archivist and photographer Jan Bowles. He hiked into the area in the spring of 1969. We were not at all certain of what we would find. I mean, all of a sudden, here was a big clearing for the helicopters. A lot of timber had been cut down. Red spray paint blazes on trees showing where roads were intended. A lot of people in there, a lot of machinery, a lot of noise, a lot of dynamite. There were enormous dynamite blasts going off, echoing down the canyon that were really kind of spooky. Tolkien's Trilogy of the Ring was very popular. I wrote that we felt more like two hobbits approaching the dark citadel of Mordor than walking into a high alpine lake. The drill rig at Little Boulder Chain Lake Number 1 showed the effluent being dumped right in the water. It wasn't clear anymore. It was that milky turquoise color in the water. There was no doubt in my mind that it would just take an entire drainage and wreck it as far as hunting, fishing, recreation, backpacking, potentially heartbreaking. Former Governor and U.S. Interior Secretary Cecil Andrus also remembers that time. In 1970, the issue of Castle Peak, the molybdenum mine, Osarco's legitimate mining claim in that area was the first time that the public saw a long period of time of debate and that the educational aspect of the importance of the environment is something that they got a taste of. It was a situation where we could explain the destruction for just simple economic gains. It was a mineral that was low priced in that time. It wasn't needed. So that election took place. Funny thing happened in 1970. A Democratic lumberjack from North Idaho stumbled into the governor's office. Two years later, Senator Church, myself, and others worked to create Sawtooth National Recreation Area. I have a beautiful photo of Castle Peak framed in my home, and the caption that I have for it when people point to it, I said, yes, that's the mountain that created a governor. And it is. It gave me that edge in 1970. Then there was a lot of publicity nationwide. This is the first gubernatorial election where an environmentalist was elected as governor of a state. So that was a situation where the people got involved. 
it really became an environmental cause for the state, one of the first big ones. But this really was a line in the sand about there are places the mines don't belong, and Castle Peak was one of them. The folks who saved Castle Peak, this was a bunch of volunteers who put this on the map and made it a statewide issue. I just think of what they accomplished without anything we kind of take for granted these days. No internet, no email. They were sending telegrams to Frank Church. They were writing letters, taking media on field trips up there. It does make you really appreciate the fact that nobody got paid to do this. They just loved the place and they weren't gonna let anything happen to it. Getting to wilderness is never easy, nor should it be. One of the things that worked against a White Clouds wilderness bill for so many years is that the 1972 Sawtooth National Recreation Area designation seemed to be working. That SNRA designation could not revoke Asarco's valid mining claims, but it did set serious limits on what the mining giant could do. When hikers and climbers to the area had complained in the late 1960s about Asarco's impact, the famous retort was, don't worry, when we're done, there won't be a lake. Hell, there won't even be a mountain. Well, obviously, that didn't happen. Today, climbing that mountain is a rite of passage for many. It's a battle against scree and huge boulders. But when you finally reach the top, you know you've done something pretty special. Castle Peak is the tallest mountain in the White Clouds and the tallest mountain in the state, not visible from a highway. Since the 1970s, the White Clouds have been discovered by climbers, hikers, those on mountain bikes, and those on motorbikes. In fact, an entire generation grew up assuming that these activities would always be possible. But as each new wilderness bill fell short, in part because of opposition from motorized user groups, wilderness advocates increasingly turned their attention to the Antiquities Act of 1906 and the idea of a national monument, something a president can create without an act of Congress. It was the threat of a national monument in the Owyhee Canyonlands, for example, that kept people working to finally reach a compromise on wilderness legislation. After you fight a campaign for 15 years and you're failing to get there, and all you can see in Congress is more polarization, more division, the chances of really getting it done were getting, frankly, more bleak. President Obama has now designated 22 national monuments. This was a very viable strategy. It came to us through Cecil Andrus. He came to our Wild Idaho conference right here and challenged us to put Congress aside and start focusing on a national monument. To ask the President of the United States to use the Antiquities Act and provide at last a long delayed protection for the Boulder White Clouds area that we fought for over long. You can't put it off any longer. The time is right now. We embrace that challenge hard as it was to create a national campaign, because that's different than getting your home state delegation. This is actually going above the home state delegation and trying to get the President of the United States to do something in a state they would never vote for. So we reached a point where one of two things were going to happen. It was either going to become a national monument, and we had conversations at the highest level of this administration, or it was going to be a catalyst for the delegation to get back to work. Both those things happened. It became clear that a monument was going to happen. Many levels. You could just feel it. And then Jim Risch, Mike Simpson sat down, made some hard choices. Other interest groups came to the table. And in, in a matter of just a couple weeks, they got that done. This was Mike Simpson's bill. He deserves all the credit on this. He's been dedicated to this and working hard on it for decades. But the way this happened was he used the collaborative system where you bring all the stakeholders to the table. The recreational users, the motorized users, 
People who are total preservationists who want to stop everything, they need to come together and it needs to be a give and take. Everybody's got to give a little and everybody gets a little. And if you get some trust going in that fashion, these things can't be done. Mike did it there, I did it on Roadless, Mike Crapo did it in the Oahe properties. So this can be done. Only way it gets done is with a collaborative approach. I think this will lead uh, more politicians to say, yeah, you can go out on a limb and try some things and see if you can bring people together to solve some of the environmental problems we have. In this state, environmental problems are huge because we have so much public land. Everybody believes that they can manage them better than the land managers that currently manage them. So that's a challenge for Idaho, but I tell you what, it's like Ernest Hemingway said, a lot of land this Idaho. Long way down. <laughs>